Forum. It's 6.30 on Wednesday, October 12th. I call this meeting to order. Lisa, please take call. Robert Downey. Present. Ben Owens. Present. Tori Anderson. Present. Gary Miller. Anne-Marie Noor. Present. Thank you. We now move on to item 1C, Pledge of Allegiance. I've asked Paul Craigbone, the PE teacher from Desert Sunrise High School, to lead us in the pledge. Thank you. I move to adoption of the agenda. Motion to approve as written. I'll second. Lisa, we have a motion and a second. Anne-Marie Noor. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. Okay. We now move on to the um, superintendent's report. Dr. Lutman. Thank you, President Downey. In honor of Civic Celebration Day, students at Desert Wind Middle School and Santa Cruz Elementary School spent time learning about the late Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Students created timelines of her work and learned about the importance of voting and civic responsibility. What a meaningful way to celebrate her life and accomplishments. Maricopa Wells and Desert Wind Middle School's dance teams gave stellar performances at the Arizona D-backs dance day prior to the Diamondbacks game on September 25th. The teams spent hours perfecting their routines and wowed spectators with their enthusiasm and precision. Thank you to dance instructor Ms. Yvonne Palm for guiding the troops to perfection. Teachers throughout the district are diving into Kagan Cooperative Learning. The teachers took part in a two-day hands-on professional development workshop that showcased strategies to boost student learning and engagement. Kagan structures carefully arrange student interaction to maximize cooperation, communication, and active engagement. Kagan structures provide common language, also provide a common language for teachers to collaborate as they are using consistent practices with their students. The end result is a classroom where all kids are actively engaged and working together to master skills. Speaking of building skills, on Monday, teachers and staff throughout the district devoted their entire day to grow professionally. 19 topics were presented and teachers attended trainings relevant to their grade levels and subject matter. Time was also set aside to prepare for students to return on Tuesday. Staff was invited to attend more than sad suicide prevention training and trauma-informed practices as, as well. Our commitment to professional development ensures, ensures that our team remains skilled, relevant, and up-to-date in their role. Students in Forensic Science at Desert Sunrise High School put their investigation skills to the test by tracking trace evidence left behind on their clothing. Students selected a garment to wear for a day and kept careful notes about where they went and items and materials they may have touched. The future crime scene investigators analyzed their garments to determine the materials that were transferred to them through the course of their day. The activity gave students a new appreciation for Locard's exchange principle, which, I, of course, is the concept <laughs> that with contact between two items, there will be an exchange of microscopic material. Hmm. Now we know. Santa Cruz Elementary and Desert Sunrise High School students received extra tutoring and TLC last week in separate academic intercessions. The extended learning opportunities are designed to reinforce skills and build confidence to pre prepare for the second quarter. Sounds like they're off to a great start. MUSD celebrated the talent and creativity of our young artists at the first Celebration of the Arts Night. The exclusive event showcased a gallery of imagination and inspiration. Student artistry took many forms, drawing, painting, photography, ceramics, and music. The artwork has transformed the district office and made a great place to work even better. 
Good attendance is essential to success. Tonight, we are celebrating four schools whose extra efforts have paid off. Each school will receive a certificate and $250 that we hope will continue to support the strategies that work best in promoting good attendance. Principals, when I call your school, please come to the dais and receive your, certi your certificate from President Downey. Congratulations go to, uh, in the following categories, best first quarter attendance, Pima Butte Elementary School. Nice job. Runner-up, best first quarter attendance, Butterfield Elementary School. <laughs> nice job. And we have most improved category. Most Improved Student Attendance, Santa Cruz Elementary School. Come on down. <laughs> nice job. And runner-up, Most Improved Attendance goes to Maricopa High School. job. So it really does pay off, literally. And that's my report, President Downey. Thank you, Dr. Um, we move on to item four, call to the public. Sorry, item three, Co government board members report. I'm actually recovering from the flu, as you can hear. My, uh, uh, um, that's um, Member Anderson. Okay, I'm not used to going first. Um, okay, so we're back, back from a fall break, in case you didn't know. I feel like today should be Friday. Actually, I thought yesterday was Friday all day. Um, so I'm trying to get in the hang of things. But there's a lot going on going forward. So hopefully you're all rested because the train is going full speed ahead. So here we go. Um, I will be at the partner lunch tomorrow. So I just want board members to know that. And then on Tuesday nights, we have been doing um, alumni cheer practice, and I want to thank Caitlin at the Firestorm Gym for taking care of that for us and kind of teaching us uh, to try to be spirit lines again. So uh, that's always been fun. And if you're an alumni cheerleader, it's Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock at the Firestar Firestorm Gym on Murphy Road. And then uh, for those that don't know, October is not only Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but it's also Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is very near and dear to my heart. And so the City Council, uh, Mayor Smith, on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock is going to be doing a domestic violence proclamation. So you'll see several. I've been passing out purple ribbons. Um, purple is the significant color for that, to remember that. So. If you have questions, give me a call. We do have a crisis line that's 24-7 that you could call anytime, and it's 520-836-0858. And anybody can call and just ask questions or just find out what to do is the next step. So I just want to put that little bit of awareness out there. And then Wednesday on the 19th is the State of the City Address, which I will also be attending, and I think several of us are attending that. So, and that is at 5 o'clock at City Hall. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Member Noor. Thank you, President Downey. Um, enjoyed fall break. I hope everyone else did. Now it's getting back in the swing of things. I was able to uh, attend a couple football games um, that occurred over fall break. And then this morning, I was at the Pima Butte Awards Assembly. 
uh, to honor the students who got A's and B's and straight A's and then the, the improved Mustangs, which is my favorite award, the motivated Mustang for the students that tried the hardest and improved the most. So it was great to be at that assembly. Thank you, Principal Allison, for putting those on. I think it's important to recognize uh, the students who try hard. And uh, just a couple things that I want to make everyone aware of. Blended learning at Desert Wind Middle School puts on a fall festival. And this fall festival is super impressive. Um, I have to tell you, when I went for the first time, I did not know what to expect and I was blown away. It is really great and it's also a fundraiser for their blended learning trip, I believe. I know it's a fundraiser. And they have a cakewalk and they have all kinds of games and it's very affordable. And that is on October 21st at Desert Wind Middle School from 5 to 8 p.m. And I highly encourage you to go if you are available that night because they do a great job putting that on. And then just friendly reminder, next week is parent-teacher conferences. So make sure you get those scheduled and uh, talk to your teachers about your students' progress. That's all I have. All right, thank you, President Downey. Uh, I th it seems like it's been a while since our last meeting, which um, really hasn't been that long, but um, September 22nd, as Dr. Lopen uh, said, we had celebration of the arts right here. Um, so it looks a little different in here uh, if you're a regular attender to our um, board meetings. Um, I encourage people to kind of uh, walk around a little bit. There's a there's all kinds of art. If you look on the back wall, um, kind of a cool banner that is eventually going to end up in the IT room. From it kind of fits them. So um, you know, there's uh, uh, a lot of hard work that's uh, and a lot of creativity um, that is now in our halls. And uh, I will tell you that the energy that was in the building that night uh, was pretty incredible. Um, we had, uh, had the band playing in the, uh, in the front entry and uh, we got here a little bit late, uh, but it was really kind of fun to see them just kind of jamming out and kind of rocking and um, so that was, uh, that was a ton of fun, so. Um, and I do believe that's all that I have for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Owen. Um, yeah, I also was able to attend the Celebration of Arts. Um, it was a very fun night. Um, Member Anderson and I were able to give out certificates to all that contributed, whether it was around the, um, the artwork, the drawings and all. And there's stuff actually out in the foyer as well that you should look at, um, really, really interesting stuff. Um, that, that's all I'm going to say about that. I'll, I'll just say I want to thank those who um, changed their calendar to accommodate the move from next Wednesday to this Wednesday um, for the State of the City um, address that's going to be there. I encourage everyone to um, try and make a city city. Uh, may not be the same as our previous mayor, um, but it certainly should be a lot of fun and a lot of information giving out. So thank you. That's all I have. <coughs> I don't have any call to the public. Nope. So we'll skip item four. And we'll move on to item five, specifically 5A, spotlight recognition. Ms. Terry. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight. Tonight, the Maricopa Unified School District is excited to honor spotlight recipients across three categories, community leaders, MUSD employees, and our students. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors at Freddy's Frozen Custard and Steak Burgers, Buff City Soap, and Ok Chin Circle for helping make tonight special for our honorees. Our first honorees 
are our community leaders who contribute time and support to make a difference in the lives of our students and families we serve. Congratulations, community leaders. As I call your name, please come forward to receive your certificate and give a quick fist bump to members of the governing board and Dr. Lopeman. Then make your way to room 123 for a group picture. And Dr. Hassan's over there, she's gonna wave. That's the way to room 123. Congratulations to Michelle Goheen, parent volunteer from Butterfield Elementary School. Ashley Large, parent volunteer from Maricopa Elementary School. Michelle Ramos, parent volunteer from Pima Butte Elementary School. Margaret Nowen, volunteer from Saddleback Elementary School. Natalie Gracia, Boys and Girls Club Program Director from Santa Cruz Elementary School. Paul Sullivan, volunteer from Santa Rosa Elementary School. Micah Buchanan, volunteer from Desert Wind Middle School. Megan Purvis, dual enrollment partner from Desert Sunrise High School. Ellen Buddington, recreation supervisor, Maricopa High School. And Hank Weaver, volunteer from Maricopa Virtual Academy. Congratulations again to these outstanding Spotlight community leaders. Next, we're proud to honor our Spotlight Employees of the Month. These staff members are phenomenal individuals who go above and beyond expectations to meet the needs of our kids and support their school communities. Congratulations, Spotlight Employees. As I call your name, please come forward to receive your gift certificate and give a quiz, quick fist bump to members of the Governing Board and Dr. Lopeman. Then make your way to room 123 for a group photo. Congratulations to Ginger Walters, library aide at Butterfield Elementary School. Peggy Weidel, kindergarten teacher from Maricopa Elementary School. Malika Abdul Kalik, preschool teacher from Pima Butte Elementary School. Santa Lopez, front office receptionist from Saddleback Elementary School. Carmen Lizraga, attendance clerk from Santa Cruz Elementary School. Priscilla Ortega, health aide from Santa Rosa Elementary School. Dawn Alexander, receptionist from Desert Wind Middle School. Megan Agnew Arnesto, sixth grade social studies teacher from Maricopa Wells Middle School. Daisy Serino, day lead custodian from Desert Sunrise High School. Jude Basiga, teacher from Maricopa High School. <laughs> K. 
Karen Spillman, history teacher from Maricopa Virtual Academy. And Eliasar Martinez, groundskeeper from MUSD Maintenance. Congratulations again to these outstanding Spotlight employees. And finally, we are thrilled to honor our Spotlight Students of the Month. School principals select these remarkable students based on their outstanding commitment to their education, their school, and their community. These students set the bar high and are recognized for their efforts in academic achievement, demonstrating great character, helping others, and being great ambassadors for their schools. Congratulations, Spotlight students, as I call your name. Please come forward and receive your certificate and give a quick fist bump to members of the governing board and Dr. Lotman. Then you make your way to room 123, Dr. Hassan, give away, for a group photo. Congratulations to Haven Lewis, fifth grade student from Butterfield Elementary School. Serenity Blackman, fourth grade student from Maricopa Elementary School. Uziel Netzia Dodzi, second grade student from Pima Butte Elementary School. Natalie Simpson, third grade student, Saddleback Elementary School. <laughs> Kayla Harrison, third grade student from Santa Cruz Elementary School. <laughs> Anthony Torres, fifth grade student, Santa Rosa Elementary School. Emiliano Calderon, sixth grade student, Desert Wind Middle School. <laughs> Noah Gutierrez, eighth grade student, Maricopa Wells Middle School. Mario Nuno Jr., freshman from Desert Sunrise High School. <laughs> Jesus Morales, senior from Maricopa High School. <laughs> and Elijah Tannen, junior from Maricopa Virtual Academy. Congratulations again to these outstanding students. Parents, we have one more recognition before you meet your kiddos back in room 123. In partnership with the Maricopa Rotary Club, we'd like to honor a deserving group of students. Rotary honors young people who are developing leadership skills and making a difference in their communities. Rotary students, as I call your name, Please come forward and Mr. Irving will present you with a special certificate. And there he is. <laughs> Congratulations to Jada Armstrong, eighth grade student, Maricopa Wells Middle School. Adrian Williams, eighth grade student from Desert Wind Middle School. Brady Crickbaum, freshman from Maricopa High School. <laughs> Jamar Lindor, sophomore at Desert Sunrise High School. <laughs> Caden Hamilton, seventh grade student from Maricopa Virtual Academy. Christian Arguez Maldonado, 
senior from Maricopa Ram Academy. Congratulations to all of our recipients tonight. Parents, you can meet your students in room 123. We will take a five minute break to allow everyone who's come for recognition tonight to make their way out or you're welcome to stay for our business portion of the meeting. It's riveting, so. <laughs> Have a great night.
Well, good evening, President Downey, Governing Board members, and Dr. Loebman. The purpose of this presentation is to review the district's capital expenditures and highlight some of the great things happening um, through, throughout the district. This presentation aligns with goal two, every student has access to an equity and excellent educational services, resources, and programs. And goal four, community pride through excellent customer service, sound business practices, open and effective communication, and safe and attractive facilities. This summary slide of projects is meant to highlight the work done throughout the district. I've included a column for the location of these projects and another column to show the funding source. The funding sources include um, our district capital fund, adjacent ways, school facilities board, uh, building renewal grants, ESSER funds, um, E-rate, and the food service fund. The building renewal grants that are awarded through the Arizona School Facilities Oversight Board are a big part of our projects. These grants can be painful to work through and drag to the finish line. Um, our team meets weekly with our SFB liaison um, that's assigned to the district to work through each submittal and try to force them closer to award and completion. I want to highlight some of those large building renewal grant projects. Um, we had a full roof replacement at Santa Rosa Elementary. Two weatherization projects, uh, one at Pima Butte and at Saddleback. We completed a project to repair um, well number one, well number two, the water tank and the pumps at Maricopa High School. That was a massive project that was stuck at the SFB approval for, uh, for, um, for several years. Mm -hmm. We also completed asphalt and concrete work at, ne either, at nearly every site last year, funded by a combination of district capital and adjacent ways. These projects included crack filling, surface recoding, as well as correcting any tripping hazards. Uh, we also completed a $5 million HVAC project, um, replacing almost every package unit in the district, as well as installing air purification. Um, that project was completed with ESSER funds. The last project I want to highlight from this list is the track replacement at Maricopa High School. It's in the final curing phase at this point. This was funded with district capital funds. Uh, we continue to fight for SFB building renewal grants. And the large projects that are our next priority include weatherization projects at Maricopa Wells and Maricopa Elementary, roof replacement at Maricopa Wells, Pima Butte, and Maricopa Elementary. And as you see there, we were just awarded the roof replacement um, grant for Pima Butte, awarded at $835,000. This table shows all of the capital spending over the last several years to truly highlight what we accomplished, especially in fiscal year 21 and 22. You can see the total capital across all funds in the, in the uh, yellow, it was orange on the original slide. Um, it increased from about $3 million a year to 10.5 million in 21 and over 50 million in 22. Um, a lot of that in fiscal year 22 was the new school construction for Desert Sunrise High School, the uh, new, con new, new school construction fund and adjacent ways fund. Additionally, in fiscal year 22, we had a $4.5 million capital expenditure from the ESSER funding for that HVAC project. If we remove spending related to the construction project, the, uh, the pinkish line there shows that we still spent $14.5 million compared to a normal $3 million capital expenditure year. Um, when we look at district funds and, our, and the competitive building renewal grants from the School Facilities Oversight Board, that's that dark blue line we really had an incredible year last year and spent nearly three years worth of capital. Um, we started a big push with our school facilities board um, building renewal grants in fiscal year 21. These numbers represent the actual money that we received um, once a project was completed. There's quite a delay in when a project is awarded and what's completed and we receive the funds. That being said, we see a large increase in, in funding from 20 to 21, and we hit a record year last year of over a million dollars. Um, we had a goal of a million. This, the last point I wanna make is that, that upper light blue line that shows our district capital fund. We receive about, a, about $3 million from the state capital funding formula, and last year we spent over eight million in capital expenditures. And we did that by moving operations dollars to cover much needed capital projects. In fiscal year 20, we made two purchases on a five-year loan. We purchased five school buses, and we purchased staff computer upgrades of almost $400,000.
the debt had an annual payment of about 277,000 a year. Um, last year we had the capacity to pay the debt off early and free up that annual payment, as well as capture a little over $20,000 in interest. We executed the early payoff of over $500,000 in debt. And then I just wanted to show off a few of the few slides showing some of the pictures of these projects. So here's some of those asphalt projects district-wide. Look how fresh that asphalt looks. Um, we also had a number of fencing projects. We did some block walls uh, repair and replacement, some wrought iron, and even some chain link all over the district. Um, we did carpet at nearly every site. This is a couple of pictures of some of the hard floor um, projects that we had. On the left is the wrestling room at Maricopa High School, and the right is the as a dance room floor at Maricopa Wells. These are some pictures from the roof replacement at Santa Rosa. Here, here are some pictures from the weatherization projects at Pima Butte and uh, Saddleback. When you drive by uh, these schools, you can really tell a difference with uh, not just the, the fresh look, but um, they're, they're much better equipped to handle rain and, and moisture penetration. Here are some pictures of the Maricopa High School track. Um, as I said, it's in the final stages there. We have that, that, that final red coat on there. It's looking really good. And then uh, we had a project to add a mezzanine to the warehouse to increase some square footage there. As we grow, we really have a lot of need with storage. And this, this helped utilize some of the, the, the space we had there. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks for letting me share those things. If you have any questions, we have it answered. Mr. Arma, I don't, I don't have any questions. Um, what I do want to say is, is I can remember five years ago we made a, a very long capital improvement list that needed to be done across the district. And so it's nice to see that I know all the focus has been on Desert Sunrise the last couple years, but thank you for making sure that really we are taking care of the maintenance across the district, that we're investing in our buildings. I know it's not all the, the fancy, shiny new stuff that, you know, that it is noticeable, but it's the roofing, it's the carpeting, it's the, it's the insulation, it's the air conditioners, it's the things that we don't normally see, but they make life so much easier in the long run. So I'm just, I just wanted to point out that we have been investing in the improvements across the district at all of our schools. We're not just you know, focusing on the new shiny thing. So thank you for making that a priority and keeping on that list. I know that some of those things have been checked off a lot faster than what we had planned. So I just, I appreciate the urgency um, in keeping our buildings safe. So thank you. One question for you. Uh, you said that with the uh, SFB awards, um, which by the way, it's awesome to see how that has grown um, and really being able to take advantage of some of those, uh, that money from, uh, from the state uh, so it's not coming out of our capital budget. Um, but you'd mentioned there's a, a, a pretty significant lag uh, between uh, a bid award uh, completion and then payment. Um, so, I'm just kind of curious, could you just give me a brief over, give us a brief overview, you know, kind of what that looks like, you know, and I'm kind of wondering then who, um, uh, who basically holds the note, so to speak, on the work that's been completed, knowing the states involved and how uh, efficiently they operate or inefficiently, um, you know, are our contractors then sitting there for months and months waiting to get paid or do we pay them and then we get reimbursed? Can you kind of walk us through that process real quick? Yeah, and it's, it can be very complicated, especially with a project. So one, one example that can highlight a lot of that is we had a uh, weatherization project at um, it's either weatherization or roof uh, at Maricopa Wells. Um, we have to go through an assessment award, and then once that's awarded, we get the, an assessment done. And then, then the next process would be a design award. Well, once we get a construction award, we, for a project that size, we would go out for a hard bid and, and select a contractor. So we selected the contractor, um, the, the lowest bid that was awarded. 
and that was done in April. The award was given from the SFB, and then when we go to schedule that, the SFB lets us know, actually, there's no money, you have to wait. Well, then we have to wait for funding to come through. Funding comes through in June, okay? So now there's a little bit of a difference between what they bid in April and what, you know, what the prices are now in June. So then we have to work through a change order, which is, which is another process. And then once we get that approved, then we can move forward. So a project that may have been awarded almost a year ago, um, or at least started almost a year ago at the, at the assessment design phase, um, we're, we're still, we still haven't started that project. This roof at Pima Butte that I said was just awarded for $800,000, that, that, that award is ours. But we're, we're not gonna start that project for, for a few months. And then that's gonna be a few month project before we actually get awarded. Depending on the size of the project, we may fund that ahead of time, but we're really open with our contractors especially a project that's 800,000, we might not have those funds in, in house to cover that. So we might wait until the very end when it's awarded. We will work with vendors th th the best that we can, but at the same time, we put ourselves at risk a little bit when we fund something before the state gives us money, because even though it's the state, you know, you never know sometimes. So we, we definitely take each one in stride and, and, and handle on a case by case basis. So hopefully that helps. Yep, gotcha, thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to underline a couple of points. So one, what Member Anderson was saying about um, the fact that we're spending money across the district in all schools. Yes, Desert's, Desert Sunrise did get, get our attention for the last 24 months and probably will, truthfully will for the next couple of years as we build out that school. But we are not ignoring the other schools in the district. And certainly I know Dr. Lopeman and the, the board are, are making sure that we don't just all get our eyes on Desert Sunrise or anything else we may do in the future. The it's important that all schools are looked at. Um, I also wanna sort of recognize and congratulate Dr. Lopeman and the whole team on the grants and awards. Um, I used to do that a long time ago with um, Honeywell Aerospace. It's not easy. It's a lot of time and effort, a lot of process and bureaucracy. And it's easy to ignore and say, I don't wanna do it, but there are significant awards and grants out there that we can get if we put the effort in. And it sometimes it's not realized just how much effort it takes to get that money in. But it can, as you see, it can't be significant. Mm -hmm. So I wanna recognize Dr. Lopeman and the team for that. The last thing is I love paying off debt. <laughs> At heart, I'm a Scottish Presbyterian. <laughs> uh, my granny, grandmother always said to me, you can never buy anything unless you're paying cash. That isn't the way we live today. But at heart, I don't like carrying debt, so I'm, I want people to recognize we're paying off debt as well, so that we have that money available in future le years to use some things that we want to pay, want to actually do then. So, congratulations, to Dr. Lopeman and you, Mr. Harmon. Okay, when I move on to um, item 5C, Superintendent's Elementary Boundary Committee update, Ms. Pastor. Thank you. Good evening, President Downey, Dr. Lopeman, board members and guests. Tonight I'll be sharing information about the Superintendent's Elementary Boundary Committee work. The Elementary Boundary uh, Committee is an important part of the MUSD strategic plan. It aligns to goal four, community pride through excellent customer service, sound business practices, open and effective communication, and safe and attractive facilities. And our strategy alignment is to prioritize and leverage district resources to support the MUSD vision, mission, and um, strategic plan. So we know the city of Maricopa is growing, and it comes as no surprise the district is also growing. MUSD has been analyzing enrollment trends and has worked with our demographer to study growth in housing to help project future enrollment. Over the past five years, MUSD has grown by 308 students a year on average. Over the next five years, we are expected to grow by an average of 440 elementary students a year. That means in five years, we'll have an additional 2,200 students in our elementary schools alone. Our schools are approaching capacity, but an important reality is that school, public schools are awarded funds to build new schools on our overall district enrollment for that grade level group. And so when it is at capacity as a group is when school facilities boards will be working with us 
for that seventh elementary school. This is why it's critical that MUSD manage growth across our el elementary schools to be spread as evenly as possible. So during the first quarter, MUSD developed a boundary committee comprised of administrators, elementary school principals, transportation staff, teachers, parents, and even a couple students. The committee began by discussing capacity and enrollment projector projections in our elementary schools. So what we see here are our six elementary schools, the number of, of whole classrooms, the school facility board capacity, the current FY23 enrollment, and the total enrollment projection in two years. You'll notice there is some uneven growth where we, should we make no changes to boundaries, we have uh, Santa Cruz and Saddleback significantly over the SFB capacity. Also of note is that we do have two of our elementary schools that are smaller in square footage, Pima View and Santa Rosa. So for the purposes of this conversation, capacity is determined by the school facilities board, and this is that entity we'd be working with to determine when we will begin the process of building our seventh elementary schools. So through conversations with the committee, we decided we wanted to manage growth across the four elementary, larger elementary schools by adjusting elementary boundaries. Of particular concern is Saddleback in Santa Cruz. And so um, you can see there that if we were to make no changes to Santa Cruz, projected enrollment of our 24, 25 is 1,416 students. During the first quarter, the committee met to discuss these growth and trends. We also discussed and agreed upon guiding principles of our work. Highlighted in yellow are those that were of critical importance to the committee. Using these guiding principles, we came up with three maps to consider. These maps will be posted on the MUSD website for community feedback. This week and next, there will be, uh, all in all, a total of eight feedback forums being held at Butterfield, Maricopa Elementary, Saddleback, and Santa Cruz. We are engaging parents and staff in conversations and collecting feedback at each of those four potentially impacted schools. And the committee will meet again in late October once all these feedback forums have concluded and after studying all the feedback, decide on a final recommendation to provide to the governing board for review and potential approval in December. With final boundaries decided as early as December, this should give us adequate time to plan for the changes that would take place in the beginning of the 23-24 school year. Staffing, transportation, moving furniture, informing families, these are all just some of the essential activities that would take place in the spring to be ready for the fall. So let's take a look at some of the alternatives that are being discussed. So what we're looking at here is um, the outside darker box shows us our MUSD boundary as a whole. And then each black box is referred to as a grid. Um, very difficult to see here in the presentation, but within each grid you have um, a black number, a red number, and a purple number. The black number is simply the number of the grid. We use this, it makes it easier for the committee to discuss um, the different areas. Um, the red number is the number of currently enrolled elementary age children in that grid. And then the purple number provided to us by the demographer was the projected number of elementary students in that grid two years from now. So in this particular scenario, we would be moving grid 15, which currently has 247 elementary age students from Santa Cruz to Butterfield. Grid 15 is in the middle of Smith Inkey Road, White and Parker, Porter Road, and Honeycutt Road. At the same time, grids 25 and 28 would be moving from Saddleback to Maricopa Elementary. These grids currently have 153 students.
So let's take a look at what enrollment would look like if we made the changes in alternative one. Highlighted in yellow are um, the schools when they are, are at 90% capacity. And that darker peach color is when schools are at capacity or beyond. As you look at the tables that correspond with each alternative map, keep in mind that what we're hoping to accomplish is to share across the schools the growth as evenly as possible. Pockets of future housing development in the Santa Cruz area does make this especially challenging, particularly in the 24-25 school year. So let's take a look at another map that was being considered. This is alternative two. In alternative two, you have the same grid 15 moving from Santa Cruz to Butterfield. But in this scenario, uh, we have grids 53 through 60. Um, in the south there, it's bordered by um, the yellow. That Those grids would be moving from Saddleback to Maricopa Elementary. These grids currently have 35 students. However, with projected housing development, these within two years, these grids would bring 171 students to Maricopa Elementary School. Something to consider about this particular scenario is that with a large number of students coming out of future housing development, this would not be a change to as many existing students, um, but rather a tr um, um, news for the families that are moving in. Here we have what enrollment would look like. Um, should we make the changes in alternative two? And the third map for consideration, um, we have grid 15 being divided into two sections with families in grid 15 that live north of Hopper going to Butterfield and those south of Hopper would remain at Santa Cruz. That would um, essentially cut that into about 125 students for Santa Cruz and 125 for uh, Butterfield. At the same time, we have the same grids that were shown in, in scenario two, 53 through 60 would be moving from Saddleback to Maricopa Elementary. Again, these grids combined currently have 35 students, but two years from now, they'll have 171 students. And these are the enrollment projections for alternative three. So next steps, here are the dates of the community feedback forums. Um, I will be at Butterfield and Maricopa Elementary School tomorrow. And next week I'll be at Santa Cruz. Um, not included here, but also happening is staff meetings as well. The Boundary Committee will meet on October 25th. Uh, here in the boardroom, we'll hold an additional public meeting on November 2nd. And then I'll be coming back to the board for a presentation on December 7th. So, Ms. Pestro, where will this, I, I know you're posting it here, but where else is this posted? Is this on our homepage? Are you going to send this out to Peachtree, to all of the, the four schools so the parents get it directly? I just, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't going to see this, and I just, I'm concerned that the message is not going to get out that parents need to come and look at these forums? Um, so the posting will go where our boundary maps currently are okay. on the website. And um, it is a version of this PowerPoint that includes a slide that describes in narrative um, which grid would be going where. So it's a, a little easier to follow. Um, I'll work with Michelle Terry okay. to see if we want to work out some additional communication, but that will be posted this evening. Is, are you going to email that to every single parent, or are you just posting it on the school's website? Uh, again, I'll work with Michelle Terry okay. to see what additional communication we can do, the peach tree, the connected okay. Um, email. Okay. I, I think the more I, we can do it, I'd rather 
over mm -hmm. communicate versus just depend everyone's going to go to the website because I think a majority of people won't go to the website. Certainly, um, we'll communicate with principals, okay. and at, and you can see those are defined areas. Right. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that the, the you know the families that live in those areas uh, are are well informed um, and have the opportunity to provide mm -hmm. feedback and and um, so that will I, I you know we are we're two days in I think on yeah. the meetings mm -hmm. and so you know um, I think we're going to achieve what what okay. you're describing okay super I mean we have to do it it's, mm -hmm. it's not an option to yeah. not yeah. change our boundaries but I just want parents to to have input and to be very much aware of how it's going to affect. But I mean, I like the fact that transportation is a part of this conversation. Um, so I just wanna make sure that the information is out there overly exaggerated almost. So thank you. Certainly. And if I can just add on to Mrs. Anderson's comment, I like how you're projecting and you're looking out rather than, all right, this is what we've gotta do this year. Mm -hmm. And then next year, uh, maybe a student in a particular area right. is going to be end ending up at a different elementary school. Uh, that's, um, I think that's probably a parent's, uh, one of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just a, just a constant shuffling around. Um, so obviously down the road, if growth continues, um, yeah, we, we should be in, in good shape. Um, new elementary comes online, obviously, then we have to go back and we gotta look at that again um, to do some redistribution and that kind of thing, so. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm thinking. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanna, again, I was gonna highlight the proactivity that you're having, the Dr. Lopeman and the team are having that we're looking out several years and trying to be as, uh, things will change. I mean, we've got a town turn in uh, building that potentially is gonna have an impact, but we have to still plan and plan two or three years from now so that we don't end up with knee jerk reactions and having to change things. Worst of all, mid year, let alone at uh, very early to the start of a new school year. The other thing I like, I was gonna highlight about the narrative that it was much easier whenever you said we're gonna move parcel 15 over if you can put that wording in that'll be great because it is hard to actually see within yeah, the grids so those little narratives Certainly. on each of the um, options would be perfect so thank you mm -hmm. thank you any other comments no. okay. we'll move on to item six consent agenda motion to approve as written second lisa we have a motion and a second and renor aye tori anderson aye ben owens aye robert downey aye so approved, we'll move on to um, seven action items, specifically 7A, uh, discuss some possible approval of personnel schedule. Mr. Beckett. Thank you, President Downey, members of the governing board, Dr. Lobin. Uh, you have the personnel schedule in front of you tonight. I had some conversations regarding uh, some of these items, but uh, I'll take specific questions at this point in time. I, I don't have any questions. It's, I, I mean, it's nice to the, uh, resignation list is very small right. it's nice to see because we are the best district in the state I mean I don't know if anybody realized that but we are <laughs> if there's no questions I'll motion to approve the personnel schedule I'll second please we have a motion a second and Marie Noor aye Tori Anderson aye Ben Owens aye Robert Downey aye so approved okay so um we're gonna follow the process that we had before. We've got seven I or four items that speak to policy. I will read the, the basic, the overview, the background to it. And obviously if any of the members have any questions or comments, they can leave it after I follow do each one. So we move on to item 7B, discussion and possible approval, the first reading of update policy JLDA, school counselors and psychologists. The proposed revision to the policy JLDA, school counselors and the policies reflects the recent changes to legislation. House Bill 2178 states that school psychologists who is employed by or contracted to provide services at the public schools must certify must be certified by the Department of Education, but is exempt from legislature. Previously, only employee school psychologists were exempt from legislature. Any 
Kristen's comment? No comment. I mean, we currently follow this anyway, correct? That's what we. That is correct. Okay. Thank you, Member Anderson. Uh, just to clarify, there there were some credentialing concerns right. between a clinical psychologist and a school psychologist. Mm. And so, if you see the references from the uh, titles, this is Title 32, which falls under professions and uh, occupations, as opposed to Title 15, which is education. Right. So it just it clarifies what a clinical psychologist's credentialing needs to be and what a school uh, psychologist's credentials should be. So uh, again, our expectation is that they have an Arizona Department of Education right. certificate. And this should make it easier for school, school psychologists, for schools to employ school psychologists. Yeah, it does increase the pool. Right. right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. Motion to approve? I will second. Please, we have a motion to second. Anne-Marie Knorr. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So approved. Move on to item 7C, discussion and possible approval of the first reading of updated policy IHA, basic instructional program. Background. The proposed revision to policy IHA, basic instructional program, reflects recent changes in legislation. House Bill 2325 established the 9-11 Educational Day and requires the schools dedicate some portion of September 11th or an adjoining non-weekend day to teaching in an appropriate fashion about terrorist attack of September 11th, 2001. Resources for age-appropriate education will be developed by the Arizona Department of Education. Motion to approve. Yeah, I will second. Lisa, we'll have a motion and a second. Anna-Marie Knorr. Aye. <coughs> Tori Anderson. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. Um, item 7D, discussion and possible approval of the first reading of updated policy IMB, teaching about controversial, sensitive issues. The proposed revision to policy IMB, teaching about controversial, sensitive issues, reflects recent changing in legislation. House Bill 2161's pri private cause of action enables parents to sue governmental entities for observing the fundamental rights of parents to direct the upbring upbringing, education, health care, and mental health for their children. The proposed revision to the policy reflects that teachers have a great responsibility to educate children, but parents ultimately direct the upbringing, education, health care, and mental health of their children. Motion to approve. I'll second. Lisa, we have a motion to second. Anne-Marie Knorr. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So approved. Move on to item 7E. Discussion and possible approval of first reading of data policy JICFA hazing. The proposed revision to policy JICFA hazing reflects changes in the re to legislation. House Bill 2322 criminalizes hazing. Hazing is a class one misdemeanor unless the victim dies and then it is a class four felony. Therefore, hazing has been redefined in the proposed policy revision and in the exhibits as an act in violation of section 13-1215 or 12-1216. Motion to approve. I will second. Lisa, we'll have a motion and a second. Anne-Marie Noir. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So approved. We now move into item 7F. Ap approved to adjourn to executive session pursuant to ARS 38431.03A13. The governing board may vote to convene into executive session for legal advice with the attorney regarding personnel matters. Motion to approve. Oh, go ahead. Motion to approve <laughs> to go into e session. Uh, I was actually going to, if, if I we may. We could do both of them at the yeah, same time. Yeah, I was going to make the motion yeah. to uh, approve okay, F and G. Well, he'll need to read I'll G. Need to re I'll need to read then G as well. Yeah. Approved to adjourn to executive session pursuant to ARS 384303A1, superintendent's evaluation for the discussion and consideration of the superintendent's quarterly progress evaluation. 
She deter superintendent advised the board that she wants this discussion to occur in open session. It will occur in open session. So motion to approve to go in e session to speak to our attorney for advice and then also to t talk to our uh, superintendent about evaluation. F and G. I'll second. Please, we have a motion and a second. Anne Marie Noor. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Ben Owens. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So approved. We're now going to e session, executive session.